Bless the Lord who forgives all our sins. His, His mercy, mercy endures, endures forever. forever. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also, also with, with you. you. Let us pray. Almighty Father, whose dear Son, on the night before he suffered, instituted the sacrament of his body and blood, mercifully grant that we may receive it thankfully in remembrance of Jesus Christ our Lord, who in these holy mysteries gives us a pledge of eternal life, and who now lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. The first lesson for this evening is from the book of Exodus. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall mark for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell the whole congregation of Israel that on the 10th of this month, they are to take a lamb for each family, a lamb for each household. If a household is too small for a whole lamb, it shall join its closest neighbor in obtaining one. The lamb shall be divided in proportion to the number of people who eat of it. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a year old male. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. You shall keep it until the 14th day of this month. Then the whole assembled congregation of Israel shall slaughter it at twilight. They shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorstops and the lintel of the house in which they eat it. They shall eat the lamb that same night. They shall eat it roasted over the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted over the fire with its head, legs, and inner organs. You shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning you shall burn. This is how you shall eat it, your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. And you shall eat it hurriedly. It is the Passover of the Lord, for I will pass through the land of Egypt that night and I will strike down every firstborn in the land of Egypt, both human beings and animals. On all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. And no plague shall destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day shall be a day of remembrance for you. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord. Throughout your generations, you shall observe it as a perpetual ordinance. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. <clears throat> Psalm 116. I love the Lord because he has heard the voice of my supplication, because he has inclined his ear to me whenever I called upon him. How shall I repay the Lord for all the good things he has done for me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. 
Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his servants. O Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant and the child of your handmaid. You have freed me from my bonds. I will offer you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call upon the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. In the courts of the Lord's house, in the midst of you, O Jerusalem. The second lesson is from 1 Corinthians. I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. God. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Glory Glory to you, Lord Lord Christ. Before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, You do not know now what I am doing, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, You will never wash my feet. 
Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, One who has bathed does not need to wash except for the feet, but is entirely clean. And you are clean, though not all of you. For he knew who was to betray him. For this reason, he said, not all of you are clean. After he had washed their feet, had put on his robe, and had returned to the table, he said to them, Do you know what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you also should do as I have done to you. Very truly, I tell you, servants are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God had been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, Everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, you Lord, Lord Christ. Christ. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the liturgical year, Monday Thursday has recently become very important to me. On one hand, I find myself deeply inspired by the message of the mandatum, Jesus' new commandment, love one another as I have loved you. And on the other hand, this night always puts a magnifying glass over some of the more uncomfortable shortcomings of my own discipleship. And each year in both study and in the liturgical commemoration, I find myself urged to do better. But before I confess all of that to you, it is important, I think, to understand what is going on in the gospel passage we just heard. John's account differs significantly from the synoptic gospels, those of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. In John's telling, for instance, we find that the meal Jesus shares with his disciples on this night is not the Passover Seder. John places this meal instead on the night before. So what the Synoptic Gospels portray as a meal of religious obligation and ritual significance, John offers simply as a meal shared amongst friends. Amid this dinner party, Jesus suddenly gets up, takes off his robes, takes the posture of a servant, and begins to wash the feet of all his disciples. They have absolutely no idea what's going on. And Peter reacts accordingly. He's taken aback, and he refuses at first, and he says, you will never wash my feet. I think faced with a similar situation at a dinner party, we'd probably react the same way. <laughs> Peter, however, enthusiastically relents when Jesus replies, unless I wash you, you will have no share with me. And after washing the feet of all his disciples, he puts on his robes again and sits back down at the table. He tells them this is the example they should follow. Do for others as he has done for them. In modern terms, he's telling them to pay it forward. 
What is interesting to me in this account is the language used in this passage. Jesus takes off his robes and he puts them on again. In the Greek, almost identical language is found earlier in the Gospel of John. In the 10th chapter where Jesus proclaims he is the good shepherd, he says, the reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. Thus, in the symbolic act of taking off these robes, washing their feet, putting the robes back on, and assuming his place at the head of the table, Jesus has already enacted the resurrection story. Later, in his farewell discourse, he will tell the disciples, no one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. This symbolic act of foot washing demonstrates that Jesus is about to do just that, even for Judas, who is about to betray him. Judas also received the full measure of grace. At the end of this interlude, Jesus gives them the new commandment for which this night is named, the mandatum, love one another. Just as I have loved you, you should also love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And if you are like me, you hear these words and you're invigorated and intend to set off with renewed intention to serve as best you can within your resources and abilities to work to be the hands and feet of Jesus in the world. And in this community, we wash a lot of feet. Nativity's commitment to outreach evidences our commitment to the mandatum. Drawn by our baptismal covenant to seek and serve Christ in all persons, we attempt to do the best we can to echo Jesus' love into the wider world. This interpretation is thoroughly inspiring on its own. I, frankly, I could say amen right now and sit down and we could just move out into the world with a refreshed commitment to serve. But I absolutely love the Gospel of John because there is almost always something more going on. John works on multiple levels, frequently employing dialectical tension within the narrative. See, normally when we have two points fixed, points or ideas, we'll often say that the truth lies somewhere between them. When there are two sides to the story, very often the third in the middle is the actual truth. But John frequently uses this device to place two ideas in opposition, thoughts or concepts which absolutely should negate one another, but in John's thinking are both completely true. This idea is on display from the very first chapter of John's Gospel in the imagery of light and darkness. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. The light does not vanquish the darkness, neither does the darkness overcome the light. Both are true. See, we also embrace this tension as Episcopalians because we sometimes like to describe ourselves as fully Catholic, yet fully Protestant. <laughs> Both are true. So what if we approach this passage with a similar idea? What if we think about the idea of being both the servant and the served? How do those ideas work together to give us a fuller picture of Jesus' message? Using this approach, we could come to realize that the task set before us isn't just to work to be like Jesus, we might also be called to emulate Peter as well. We have to work to humble ourselves in order that Christ's message might be fully expressed. Because what if in the race to be like Jesus, we accidentally and inadvertently exalt ourselves? This is where my discomfort kicks in. So I offer to you the message that I often find myself needing to hear. Serving others sometimes means that we graciously receive the service they offer to us. Now, I absolutely do not mean to say that we should just sit back and wait on people to serve us. That would be as incomplete a reading of the text as focusing only on serving. Uh, well, and it's probably worse. 
What I simply mean to say is that sometimes serving others can mean humbling ourselves in ways that might feel uncomfortable in order that we might receive the service Christ is inspiring them to offer. Now, I'll admit, at this thought, my Midwestern Protestant upbringing started screaming in the back of my head, are you nuts? I have a recollection of some Bible study or Sunday school teacher in my youth once telling me that I was only to accept a glass of water given in Jesus' name. But when we graciously receive the service of others, that which is offered in love, we allow ourselves to be both Peter and Jesus, and we affirm in the giver the Christ our baptismal covenant calls us to seek. In some cases, this exchange can be quite easy, like in this community, where we support one another through the exchanging of prayers, meals, and other acts of service in times of hardship. We always pull together when one of our own experiences a loss, and we are there together to celebrate one another's joy. The tension between served and servant can sometimes be relaxed in a community that's close like ours. Sometimes, however, this service comes in forms that we perceive as far too extravagant, like the alabaster jar of perfume used to anoint the feet of Jesus. We often try to rationalize that our acceptance of something offered might be a waste of resources too precious to the giver. But I have to ask myself, is this pride? Sometimes we must graciously receive that which is offered, even if we know it can't be spared without sacrifice. Such sacrifice allows the giver to emulate Jesus and prevents us from perpetually casting them in the role of Peter. And this can get pretty uncomfortable. As I was discussing this interpretation with Philip a couple of weeks ago, he shared a story with me. He had gone on a mission trip to Lithuania to help repair a Methodist church that had been desecrated in the Second World War. During his time there, he was taken to meet with one of the congregants at her home, an older woman, and he described her as living in a single room, one in which he thought maybe she had lived her entire life. He described this room as so small, you could stretch out your arms and practically touch both walls. And she offered Philip her breakfast. Philip's initial reaction would have aligned with mine, I can't possibly accept, you need it more than I do. But recall Peter's denial, you will never wash my feet. Recall Jesus' response. Philip's translator pointed out to him that the woman was being Jesus in that moment and led him to affirm her faith in acceptance. My dad recounts a similar story of a dinner invitation while he was on a mission trip to build churches in Nicaragua, a dinner prepared with food his hosts probably really couldn't spare. On occasion, however, this service arrives in even more challenging ways. There are times when our souls are served by the voice of a prophet rising up from within a marginalized population, a voice crying out from under the yoke of systemic oppression. A voice calling us to repentance, serving our souls by once again proclaiming the gospel message of Jesus. The events of last summer were one such prophetic occasion as voice after voice cried out in pain, asking all of us to repent, to tear down systems that prevent certain classes and races of people from being fully acknowledged as fully human. And we have a choice. We can graciously and humbly receive the message, or we can allow it to fall upon deaf and hardened ears, saying, you will never wash my feet. We made that solemn promise to seek and serve Christ in all persons. And I'll quote the presiding bishop here, all means all, no asterisks. When one part of the body of Christ is suffering, the whole body suffers as a consequence. 
There is no hierarchy in suffering. By acting as a full and vested member of the community in both giving and receiving service, we live into the gospel message. In providing service, we offer the love of Christ to someone else. And in humbly receiving from others, we receive Jesus. So even though John's gospel doesn't include the institution of the Eucharist in his account of this dinner among friends, communion began nonetheless. A communion of servanthood in which we are called to be both like Jesus and like Peter. To serve by both giving in love and humbly receiving. I take comfort in knowing that within our community, we continue to live into this communion of servanthood. And this is evidenced by the close connections that we have maintained during the diaspora of this past year. Despite the fact that we are again unable to gather to liturgically enact the washing of one another's feet, that communion continues to persist. And together we remain in the communion Jesus instituted in John, despite the fact that we have been unable to celebrate the Eucharistic meal on a regular basis. Communion endured the pandemic. So on this night of dialectical tension, it is my prayer that we will always remember that as we reach out in service to take the hand of another person, emulating Jesus, that we must also acknowledge the Peter within us and allow them to hold our hand in return. Amen. Apostles, prophets, martyrs, servants, to pray for the church and all humankind, saying, Come, Lord Jesus. For refugees, for the homeless, and for all who have nowhere to lay their head, we pray, Come, Come Lord, Lord, Lord Jesus. Jesus. For those unable to eat at the Lord's table or at any other table, we pray. Come, Come, Lord Jesus. Jesus. For the body of Christ, fractured in a world of violence and war, we pray. Come, Come Lord, Lord Jesus. Jesus. For those who betray and for those whom they betray, we pray. Come, Come Lord, Lord Jesus. Jesus. For all in any need, especially Becky, Betty, Bill, Carol, Chloe, Dave, Don, Don, Ella, Frank, Henry, Jack, Janie, John, Karen, Linda, Marion, Mary, Maxine, Pam, Patsy, Randy, Ron, and Tim, we pray. Come, Come Lord Jesus. For ourselves who gather to celebrate the Lord's Passover, in the bread we eat 
in the cup we drink. We pray. Come, Lord Jesus. <clears throat> For our friends, family, and neighbors, especially Alan, Allie, Alice, Anne, Anna, Amanda, Audrey, Barbara, Becky, Bernadette, Beth, Betty, Bob, Carl, Kathy, Christina, Danielle, Danielle, David, and Diane. We lift up Don, Eddie, Estelle, Gary, Gay, Gemma, Gwendolyn, Helen, Henry, Jada, Janet, Jason, Jason, Jeanette, Joanne, Justin, Karen, Karen, and Kathleen. We ask for healing for Kay, Keith, Kelly, Kelvin, Ken, Leisha, Lynn, Mark, Marino, Mary, Megan, Melanie, Michelle, Nancy, Nancy, Nick, and Pam. We pray for Patricia, Patricia, Paul, Renee, Richard, Roy, Sam, Sarah, Sarah, Shannon, Shirley, Spencer, Stephen, Stephen, Steve, Steve, Vicki, Vivian, Vivian, William, and those we name now. We pray, come, come Lord, Lord Jesus. Jesus. For all those who are expecting a child, especially Allie and AJ, Corey and Robert, Kristen and Bailey, Maggie and Phil, Michelle and Roy, Rachel and Todd, and Tia and Jason, we pray. Come, Come Lord Jesus. For those who have died, especially Loretta Jividen, Brian Long, and Julia Clark McCormick, we pray. Come, Come, Come Lord, Lord, Lord Jesus. Jesus. Almighty God, we recall the wonders you worked for our ancestors, and we marvel at the love shown us by your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> and now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we pray, Our, our Father, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give, give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. <clears throat> 